Hello. <laughs> Today I'm going to be reading from Heidi. Uh, I'm going to be reading chapter seven, An Uncomfortable Day. Now remember she has just gotten to Frankfurt and lives with Clara now. She's no longer with the Alm uncle. Heidi was lying in a high white bed in a large room. Nearby stood two chairs and a sofa with large flowers on them. In the corner was a washstand, and there were things on it which Heidi had never seen before. Suddenly, she, re she remembered that she was in Frankfurt, and she jumped out of bed and dressed. So here's a picture of Frankfurt, how it might have looked at that time. It's a big city in Germany. She went first to one window and then to the other, for she wanted to see the sky and earth outside. She felt as if she were in a cage behind the long curtains. She could not push them aside, so she crawled in behind them in order to reach the window. But this was too high for her to see out. Like a little bird placed for the first time in a handsome cage, she flew from one window to another. She wanted to see something besides walls. She felt that she must see the green grass and the last melting snows on the cliff. There was a knock on the door and Tinette thrust in her head. Breakfast ready, she said curtly. Heidi did not understand that these words meant an invitation. Tinette's scornful face seemed to warn her not to come too near and Heidi acted accordingly. She took the little footstool from out from under the table, placed it in a corner, sat down on it and waited to see what would happen. After some time, she heard a bustling, and Fräulein Rottmeier came into the room. What is the matter with you, Adelheid? Don't you understand what breakfast means? Come down. Heidi understood this and followed her at once. Clara was waiting in the dining room and gave Heidi a friendly greeting. She looked much more contented than usual, for she expected all sorts of strange things to happen that day. The breakfast passed without any disturbance. Heidi ate her bread and butter properly, and after the meal was over, Clara was rolled back into the library. When the two children were alone, Heidi said at once, How do you see outdoors and way down to the ground in this house? We open the windows and look out, replied Clara, amused at the question. I can't reach them, said Heidi. Ask Sebastian. He will open them for you, said Clara. Then Clara asked Heidi about her home, and Heidi felt almost happy again when she began to talk about the alm and her grandfather and Peter and the goats. In the meantime, the Herr Kandidat had arrived, and Fräulein Rottenmeier took him into the dining room. She told him how Herr Sesemann had asked her to find a companion for his daughter, and how disappointed she was in the child who had come. It would be necessary for the Herr Kandidat to begin his instructions with the alphabet. She suggested that he tell Herr Sesemann that the two children could not be taught together without great harm to the more advanced pupil. Then she was sure that the master of the house would be willing to have the strange child sent away. But the Herr Kandidat was very discreet. He tried to say a few consoling words to Fräulein Rottenmeier, but said he would be glad to undertake to teach the new child her ABCs. Then he opened the heavy oak door and went into the library. Fräulein Rottenmeier strode up and down the room, considering how the servants should address Edelheid. But she was not to meditate long, for suddenly from the library came a frightful crash. She rushed into the room. There on the floor, everything lay in a heap. Books, copy books, inkstand, and on top of all the rest, the table cover. Heidi had disappeared. Just look at that, exclaimed Fräulein Rottenmeier, wringing her hands. Table cover, books, and work basket, everything covered with ink. It must be that wretched child again. The Herr Kandidat stood looking at the destruction in dismay, but Clara seemed delighted. Yes, Heidi did it, she said, but not on purpose, so she must not be blamed. She was in such a hurry to get away, she pulled the cover with her and everything fell with it on the floor. Several carriages went by and she rushed out. Perhaps she had never seen a coach before. There, isn't it just as I told you, Herr Kandidat? The creature hasn't an idea about anything, not a suspicion what a lesson hour is, and that she ought to sit still and listen. But where is the child? If she has run away, what would Herr Sesemann say to me? Fräulein Rottenmeier darted out and down the stairs. There, in the open doorway, stood Heidi, quite perplexed, looking up and down the street. 
What is the matter with you? Why have you run away? demanded Fräulein Rottmeier. I heard the fir trees roar, but I don't know where they are, and I don't hear them any longer, answered Heidi sadly. The noise of the rolling carriages had died away. Heidi had mistaken the sound for the wind blowing through the fir trees, and she had wanted to see them. Firs? Are we in the woods? What a notion! Come up and see what you have done. Heidi followed Fräulein Rottenmeier upstairs and was very much astonished to see the great damage done. In her haste to hear the fir trees, she had not noticed what she was dragging. When you are having lessons, you must sit still in your chair and pay attention, said Fräulein Rottenmeier. If you cannot do it by yourself, I shall have to fasten you to your seat. Do you understand? Yes, I will sit still now, replied Heidi, for she began to comprehend what she was expected to do. In the afternoon, Clara always had to take a long nap, and Heidi was told she could do as she pleased. She already had a plan, so she waited in the hall until she had a chance to speak with Sebastian. I would like to ask you something, she said. All right, go ahead, Mamsel, he answered. My name isn't Mamsel, my name is Heidi. That's all right, Fräulein Rottmeier told me to call you so, explained Sebastian. Did she? Well then, I must be called so, said Heidi resignedly, for she had noticed that everything had to be as Fräulein Rottmeier wished. Now I have three names, she added with a sigh. What did the little mamsell want to ask of me, said Sebastian. How do you open the window, Sebastian? This way, he replied, leading the way to the dining room and swinging out one of the big windows. Heidi went to it, but her head barely reached the sill. There now, the little girl can look out and see what there is below, said Sebastian, bringing a high wooden stool and setting it down. Heidi climbed up with great delight and was able at last to take the longed for look out the window. But there is nothing to see, she said in a disappointed voice, except the stony street. What is there on the other side of the house, Sebastian? Just the same, was the answer. But where do you go to see way down across the whole valley? You have to climb up into some high church tower, like the one over there with the golden dome. From up there, you can see away ever so far. Then Heidi climbed down from the stool, ran out of the door, down the stairs, and went out into the street. But she did not find it as she imagined it would be. When she saw the tower through the window, she fancied she would only have to go across the street and it would be just in front of her. She went down the entire length of the street without coming to the tower. She could no longer see it anywhere. She came to another street and then another, but still she did not see the tower. A great many persons passed her, but they were all in such a hurry that Heidi thought they would have no time to talk to her. Finally, she saw a boy standing on the corner of the next street. He was carrying a small hand organ on his back and a strange animal in his arms. Probably a monkey. Heidi ran up to him and asked, where is the tower with the golden dome? Won't you show me where it is? Show me first what you will give me if I do. The boy held out his hand. Heidi searched in her pocket. She drew out a little picture on which was painted a garland of red roses. She disliked to part with it for Clara had given it to her that morning. But more than anything, she wanted to look down into the valley across the green slopes. Will you take that? asked Heidi, holding out the picture. The boy shook his head. What do you want then? asked Heidi, delighted to put her picture back into her pocket. Money. I haven't any, but Clara has and she will give you some. How much do you want? Twenty finnigs. Well then, come along. The two went through a long street and Heidi asked her companion what he was carrying on his back. He explained that under the cloth he had an organ which made wonderful music when he turned the handle. At last they came to an old church with a high tower. And here's a picture. There, said the boy. Heidi noticed a bell in the wall and pulled it with all her might. You must wait for me because I don't know the way back, she said. What will you give me if I do? What shall I have to give you? 20 finnigs more. A key was turned in the lock on the inside and the creaking door opened. An old man stepped out and looked at first surprised and then angry. How did you dare to ring for me to come down, he said. 
Can't you see what it says under the bell? For those who wish to ascend the tower. Heidi replied, I want to go up into the tower. What do you want to do up there? asked the tower keeper. I want to go up so that I can look down, she answered. Go home and don't play any more tricks on me or you won't get off so easily another time. Whereupon the tower keeper turned around and was about to shut the door, but Heidi held him by the coat tail. Only just this once, she begged. She looked at him so beseechingly that he changed his mind. Taking the child's hand, kind, he said kindly, if you are so anxious to go, come with me. The boy sat down on the stone step in front of the door to wait. Heidi, holding the tower keeper's hand, climbed many, many steps, which grew smaller and smaller. Finally, she, won she went up an extremely narrow staircase, and then she was at the top. The keeper lifted her up to the high open window. There now, look down, he said. Heidi saw far below her a sea of roofs, towers, and chimneys. It is not at all what I thought it would be, she said in a tone of disappointment. Is that so? What does a little girl like you know about a view? Well now, come down and don't ring at a church door again. The keeper put Heidi on the floor and started down the narrow stairs in front of her. On the left, where they began to grow wider, there was a door which opened into the keeper's room. Close by, where the floor extended out under the sloping roof, stood a large basket, and in front of it sat a big gray cat. You may look at the kittens if you like, said the tower keeper. They're in the basket. Heidi went to the basket and screamed with delight. Oh, the cunning little creatures, she exclaimed again and again, running back and forth around the basket to watch the eight little kittens as they crawled and jumped and tumbled over one another. Would you like one? asked the tower keeper. For my own? To keep always? asked Heidi, hardly able to believe in such good luck. Yes, to be sure. You can have them all if you have room for them, said the man, glad of a chance to dispose of the kittens. Heidi was delighted. The kittens would have so much room in the big house, and how surprised and pleased Clara would be. But how can I carry them? asked Heidi. I will bring them to you. Only tell me where, said the keeper. To Herr Sesamon's house. There is a golden head of a dog with a big ring in his mouth on the front door, explained Heidi. I know where it is, but whom shall I ask for? You don't belong to Herr Sesamon, do you? No, but Clara will be delighted to have them. If I could only carry one or two with me, one for myself and one for Clara. Why can't I? Help yourself, said the keeper, and Heidi's eyes shone with delight. She chose a white kitten and a striped yellow and white one, and she put one in her right pocket and the other in her left. Then she went down the stairs. The boy was still sitting on the steps outside. He started off on a run with Heidi after him, and in a short time they stood directly in front of Herr Sesamon's house. Heidi rang the bell. Sebastian soon appeared, and when he saw Heidi, he exclaimed urgently, Quick, quick! Heidi ran in in great haste, and Sebastian closed the door. He had not noticed the boy standing disappointed outside. Quick, mamselle, said Sebastian. Go right into the dining room. They are already at the table. Fraulein Rottenmeier looks like a loaded cannon. But what made the little mamselle run away so? Heidi went into the dining room. Fraulein Rottenmeier did not look up, and Clara said nothing. There was an uncomfortable silence. Sebastian pushed up Heidi's chair. Adelheid, I will talk with you later, said Fraulein Rottenmeier sternly. Now I have only this to say. You have behaved very badly and deserve to be punished for leaving the house without asking permission. I never heard of such conduct. Meow, sounded as the apparent answer. Then the lady grew angry. What, Adelheid? she exclaimed, raising her voice. After such behavior, do you dare to play a naughty trick? You had better be careful, I assure you. I didn't, began Heidi. Meow, meow. Sebastian put his tray down on the table and rushed out of the room. Leave the table, said Fraulein Rottenmeier furiously. Heidi, much frightened, rose from her chair and tried once more to explain. I really didn't. Meow, meow, meow. But Heidi, said Clara, when you see how angry you are making Fraulein Rottenmeier, why do you keep saying meow? I am not doing it. It is the kittens. 
Heidi was able to speak at last without interruption. What? Cats? Kittens? screamed Fraulein Rottmeier. Sebastian, Tanette, find the horrible creatures and take them away. Whereupon the lady rushed into the library and fastened the door in order to be safe. For to Fraulein Rottenmeier, kittens were the most dreadful things in the world. Sebastian was standing outside the door and had to stop laughing before he could enter the room again. While he was serving Heidi, he had noticed a little cat's head peeping out of her pocket, and when it began to meow, he had hardly contained himself long enough to set his tray on the table. At last, he was able to go back calmly into the room. By this time, everything was quiet and peaceful. Clara was holding the kittens in her lap, and Heidi was kneeling by her side, playing with the two tiny, graceful creatures. Sebastian, said Clara, you must help us. You must find a bed for the kittens, where Fraulein Rottenmeier will not see them, for she is afraid of them and will have them taken away. I will take care of them, Fraulein Clara, replied Sebastian willingly. I will make a fine bed for them in a basket and put it where the timid lady will never look. Just leave it to me. Sebastian went on with his work, chuckling to himself, for he did not at all dislike to see Fraulein Rottenmeier a little distressed. Have the horrible creatures been taken away? called Fraulein Rottenmeier through a crack in the door. Yes, indeed, answered Sebastian. Quickly, he took the two kittens out of Clara's lap and disappeared with them. We'll see what happens to the kittens on the next episode.